We are going to get this uh, service started with some praise. And uh, so if you please rise and make some noises for Jesus.
That's like me. Plan B. <laughs> My name is Ted, and I'm the office administrator for our church. Thank you for choosing the worship with us this morning. We have a lot of visitors, I see, and some we weren't really expecting got some crew with us today. <laughs> we really missed you guys last year when we all shut down for that cold day. And we so used to have it every Father's Day. We look forward to the crew coming. You guys are a week early. That's okay. <laughs> We're so grateful to have you here. And we look forward to meeting you after the service. So thank you for coming and worship with us today. And all the other visitors as well. Please get out your, uh, your bulletins and look them over for a few minutes. While I uh, talk about a few things. There's a little card in here. Please take the time. Especially the crew people that go out with a card for us. And if you are a crew, to write on their crew. So I know that you are part of uh, their crew. And I'll keep you um, a little bit separate for, for reasons I will tell you later. <laughs> I put together an uh, email list. I like to email you guys and see what's going on all the time. So I like to have you I know who is the crew and who is not the crew. So I that's why I get that. <coughs> couple of announcements in here. Uh, we are getting really, really close to uh, Vacation Bible School. Next Sunday is Setup Day. So we're going to use as many hands as we can get. Plan on staying. We'll have some kind of a snack lunch. And then we will start setting up. We'll be putting up pop-up tents and doing decorations, moving tables and chairs and all kinds of things like that. So we can definitely use some help. And it's a lot of fun as well. It's a good fellowship time. I think excited about welcoming uh, all these children the next, the following day. So be prepared for that. Also, a couple weeks away is uh, the, the Farewell Fellowship for the Gonzalez family. So plan on coming for that. That's June 27th. This will be a potluck. So plan on bringing something to share. And we have some uh, babies that have arrived. This is kind of an old announcement. Um, if you don't know, Brian and Julie Chris had their baby. It was on May 31st. It was five weeks early. But uh, little Theodore, nice name, huh? <laughs> <laughs> They're going to call him Theo, I believe. Um, so he is doing fine. He's still in the hospital last night. He has some developing to do because he was so early. But he's doing fine, and Julie is doing fine as well. And about two or three, almost three weeks late, Hannah and James had their third son, Enoch, who was born at 12.06 a.m. this morning. So, it's God timing, not ours, right? One was way early, one was pretty late. So, it's all, it's all about God's timing. So you can uh, reach out and uh, congratulate all those families. That's uh, Jackie and Bob Bailey's eighth grandchild. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any announcements that I failed to make this morning? All right, let's continue with our, with our worship service. I really like the opening song, I Will Rise. If you look at the words, there's so much sound theology. That's one thing people always liked about uh, the hymns. The hymns had a lot of sound theology in them. And so did a lot of the worship songs as well. And this is a really good example of that. A lot of things right out of the Bible in that song. And as I was preparing today, one of the things that really struck out to me was the line that says, No more sorrow, no more pain. I will rise. The scripture that this comes from in Revelation 21, verse 1 to 4, and I think it's one of the most encouraging scriptures in the Bible. I'm going to read that for our opening passage today. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Think about that for a second. The entire city coming out of heaven, coming down. Wow. <laughs> You're awestruck, right? And I heard a loud voice in the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, There'll be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain. 
for the old days has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. The first time that I read this, I had a laugh out loud. Just think about this. Here is God himself. He's probably talking to John, and he says, write this down. This is good stuff. <laughs> I just thought that's so amusing. <laughs> God is telling you this is, this is what's going to happen. Make sure you write it down. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, your words are indeed trustworthy and true and so encouraging. When we see the world we live in falling apart around us, it's so encouraging to know that you will make all things new. We so look forward to the time you will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And it's hard for us to imagine a world with no mourning, no death, and no pain. We ask you, O oh Lord, to give us strength to persevere until this time is right. And you bring forth your new heaven and your new earth. We ask you, Father God, to be with us during your time of worship. And may everyone here come away encouraged. In Jesus' name, amen. everyone will please stand up and we can get some seeing the Jesus done. Um, one of the, uh, we have some new folks here today and I just want to let you know that um, we we have some singers here. Uh, we have a lot of different people who sing with us here that sing real pretty. And sometimes when we want you guys to not sing and just listen to them, we'll take the words down. And so if there's no words up there, we don't want you to sing. We just want you to listen to that pretty singer set the mood. But if there's words up there, sing, no matter how good one, one of us sound. <laughs> so uh, please enjoy.
with his offering bag in the back. If you wish to give to God's work through our ministries, please uh, leave whatever you wish in the back. Also, connection cards. If you give those to one of the um, readers on your way out, or also put that in the basket in the back as well. So our offering scripture today comes from uh, Malachi, uh, chapter 3, verse 8 through 10. Will a man rob God? Did you rob me? But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. But there may be food in my house. Test me in this says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you would not have room enough for it. No, God does not want, because he need our money. What he wants is our obedience. He wants us to be faithful to his word. We are commanded in Leviticus to give a tenth of what we have. In the New Testament, Jesus reiterates this when he says, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. Let us pray together. Dear Lord, everything we have is yours. You have provided it for us. We ask that you allow us to be good stewards of what you have so generously given us. Let us each give our full tithes, that we will not become guilty of robbing you. We ask you to accept our tithes and our offerings and use them to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to have the kids in the back. The teachers as well. Say good morning to the rest of us. The song. Anything back there? Sarah, is that your fault? No. You sure? <laughs> Point fingers? I didn't teach you to do that. <laughs> All right, hopefully you have your Bibles. We are going to start in Acts chapter 17 today. And we are starting a new series in the book of 1 Thessalonians. And really, if we think about the, uh, the title of the series... You see on the sheet there, is living a life of focus and expectation of Jesus' return. And uh, here's the question for us. As we think about what God has for us, the question that we're going to see over and over is, if Jesus was to return today and, and to bring us up into heaven, and as we saw, we, we, we were doing a study in the Sunday school class just on the end times and prophecy and other things, but... Uh, in Luke 21, Jesus makes a comment, and he's teaching the disciples, and he says, always be ready to be alert, to be watchful, and pray that you would be counted worthy to escape all the trouble that's coming and to stand before the Son of Man. And the question, what's, what we're going to see through, uh, really, the book of Thessalonians is, if Jesus came back today, how would it go for each of us? We're going to stand before him. We're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, not for our salvation. That's been handled on the cross. Jesus said in John 19, verse 30, that uh, it is finished. However, uh, if you got saved yesterday or five years ago, 20 years ago, it doesn't matter. Um, when we stand before Jesus, he's going to say, okay, I saved you. I gifted you. I gave you resources of time and other things. What did you do with it? And if he came today, would we, would we be ready? And what Paul does um, in Acts chapter 17, we see him, I think I have a map here, if you don't mind, sir, go to the next one, is, uh, this is a map of the, it says Asia Minor here on the right, on the left is Greece, and this is, on the right is modern day Turkey, so you, we're kind of getting a glimpse here of where we're at. Down here at the bottom right would be Israel, the Mediterranean. And in Asia Minor here on the right is the churches that Paul had founded on his first missionary journey. Uh, basically, Acts 13 and on. And then what he does 
is he decides afterwards in Acts chapter 16 to go on another missionary journey. This is his second one. And he's over there in a city called Troy, as you can kind of see it there. I'm sorry, it's a little small. But on the top is Macedonia. And Paul gets a vision in uh, Acts chapter 16 of a guy standing in Macedonia and says, Hey, come help us. So then Paul gets in a ship and crosses over to what we would say is the really the continent of Europe and begins to share the gospel there. And uh, below Macedonia, you see uh, Philippi, which is where Philippians comes from. And then just there is Thessalonica. And Paul goes there. So in Acts chapter 17, I, I want to read this just to get a flavor, because I want you to imagine for a moment that uh, the gospel had not gone here yet. So you think we're roughly around 51 AD. This is a Roman area, Roman Empire area. It's in Greek, it's in Greece, but they are thoroughly Roman. This particular city um, was granted free freedom in the sense of they, they could rule uh, under Rome's authority, but yet they had a lot of freedom because they were very loyal to Rome. And you think about that. They, uh, they had temples. Oh, I've got another picture here. Let's go to the next one. Let's see. So here's the modern harbor of, today it's called Thessaloniki, and it, it's a harbor town, very, very wealthy, lots of resources, lots of, lots of mining, lots, it, this was on the main harbor, which allowed them to be very wealthy in the sense of trade. So, uh, go to the next one. Oh man, sorry. It looks so much better on a computer. But this is a, 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 a drawing of what they have found archaeologically. And what you see there, what you, or don't see there, is um, the temples uh, to Zeus and, and uh, the Caesars and all the Roman deities. So Paul shows up, and he's going to start preaching to these thoroughly, let's call them pagans. That's what they were. They, they, they were totally committed to all of the Roman pantheon and the Greek pantheon. And he's coming in, and he starts, as he normally does, at the Jewish synagogue. And it's no different in some ways that we go along. Imagine going to a, uh, imagine today you were to be invited to a conference on the new age. And you walk in there and you start talking to people and you go, yeah, 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 all the things you guys are discussing, totally wrong. I'm here to tell you about Jesus and salvation can only be found in him. Therefore, all of your new age beliefs, complete paganism, heresy, and it's not going to get you anywhere. How fast are you going to win friends and influence people? Okay. <laughs> not very fast, right? And so that is the context in Acts chapter 17. Um, let's jump there. I hope you guys are already there. He says, uh, starting in verse 1, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Messiah, or the Christ, had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and say, This Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. So, it's interesting here, he starts with the Jews, which is very reasonable because they have a, an Old Testament background, so he starts there. But the Jews um, were very influential in the town, and there were others that were Gentiles who were followers of the God of Israel. But in reality, uh, I don't know if you can see it, there's a Jewish quarter there. Uh, but this little Jewish quarter was surrounded by paganism. And Paul spent three Sabbaths, which... Um, means that he was there at least two weeks, uh, maybe plus one day, or less than three weeks. That's important. Because as he comes there, he spends three weeks there, or less, and he starts teaching them about Jesus, and what we'll see when we get into the book of Thessalonians is he's, he, he's talking to them about the end times. He's talking about the Antichrist. He's talking about the coming day of the Lord. He's talking about the tribulation. And we talk about being baptized in, imagine being a new believer, and you get a two-week or three-week lesson on the whole gamut of the second coming of Christ and everything. Paul didn't think or didn't believe that prophecy or being ready for the Lord's return was something in the 201 class. 
He's like, oh, you're saved? Okay, great. I'm going to tell you about what Jesus did for you, how he died for your sins, but let's talk about his return. And we'll see that. So he says in verse 4, And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews who were not persuaded became envious. They took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathered a mob, and they set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, Paul and Silas, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. So, as we saw in the previous slide, Paul and his first missionary journey got blessed. And so, the gospel is going out into uh, what we'd say Asia Minor or Western Turkey, and it's turning the world upside down. And the gospel is going out, God is blessing it, he's, getting, he's saving people, and now they've jumped over to the land of what we know as Europe, and these guys are going, well, we heard about this, and they're coming here to cause trouble. And it says in verse 7, Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. So as Paul goes and he's preaching in the synagogue, and it's the words getting out, he is saying, Caesar is no king, Jesus is king. We'd all agree with that, right? The book of Revelation hadn't been written yet, but we know that Jesus is called the king of kings. So these guys... Uh, you got to remember that these city, these rulers here, I'll show you something in a minute on that, but in order to receive the benefits of Rome, which really was tax-free for these cities, you had to protect Caesar's reputation, or else Rome would come in and take away some of your benefits. So when, when Paul comes and starts preaching that there's another king, and it goes against the decrees of Caesar, if you were a ruler... What would you say? Hey, man, shut these guys up. I don't want them messing with our economy, messing with our freedoms. We get all these benefits from home. These guys are going to threaten our way of life. They're going to they threaten our culture. So they arrest Jason. They bring him before the mob. And it says, and they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Then their brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. So they sent Paul away to hide him out. But I want to show you something. Go to the next slide here. Here is a, just if you like archaeology, it's kind of fun. Here is what they have um, excavated of the ancient city, which where Paul would have been. Uh, you can see it's surrounded by the modern, but they're still getting stuff, which is really cool. Again, when we read the Bible, it's not a story book. It's not a fairy book. It's not a fantasy book. It's a story of truth and accuracy. Uh, let's go to the next one. For, for This is what I love here. Uh, it's really small. But if you were to magnify that, if you, if you know how to read Greek, one of the things that it says in there is, um, you know, surely the gospel or the, the book of Acts has been around for a long time. And I, I love it when skeptics are shut down. And what I mean by that is throughout history, before a lot of the archaeological movement, scholars who were skeptical said, man, Luke, the writer, doesn't know how to write history. And because what he does is, in this particular passage in Acts 17, 8, he calls these people, the rulers of the city, he calls them politarchs. That word, if you go back a few hundred years, appears nowhere in history. Luke's just making it up as he goes along. Well, lo and behold, God says, okay, I'll show you something. Uh, as they were doing some archaeological excavations, they come along this stone, and you can look at it and read it. I wish I would have blown it up, but it says very clearly, Polytarchs. And, and it just, all of a sudden, they're like, oh, I guess Luke wasn't as inaccurate as he's been labeled to be. And so, in fact, they found over 50 different um, evidences of and inscriptions of this word polytarchs, which only appears in this area. And Luke just happens to be, is, is it coincidentally right? Not for a second. So Luke is writing this, but through the 
testimony of time, all of a sudden God allows some archaeological excavation, and Luke is vindicated in his historical accuracy. I think that's all I got here. But turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, because I want you to see something here. I want us to see the context, and here's what I mean. The question for us as Christians is, are you willing to be a troublemaker? I mean, really, if you, I mean, we can be silent, we can shut up, we can take your religion, keep it in the church, keep it silent, only speak when you're around people that are like you or we're safe in here, or sometimes we're not safe, but if we come to the church, we can lock the doors, and we can simply preach to the choir. That's not what the Bible teaches. Here, the description that Paul gives, or that they give of Paul, is that this guy's a troublemaker. Him and his group have turned the world upside down with their doctrine. And what Paul is, he, he, he spends three weeks or less preaching the gospel in the synagogues. The Thessalonians, some of them get saved, but it's still a small group. And Paul leaves. I mean, he's, he's being threatened. He leaves that night, and he goes down to Berea, which is another area a little bit away. But God does an amazing thing. He saves a group, and they begin to share the gospel with all their pagan neighbors. Think about this. We come and we preach to you that Caesar is nothing. Zeus, nothing. Jesus is king. Jesus is the only way. Yeah, this guy from where? What? Well, the land of Israel. I don't even know where that is. Who are these people? Well, over there in the Roman Empire. You're saying some, some Jewish peasant who claimed to be a prophet and died on a cross is my savior? And Paul says, yeah, that's exactly right. Because not only is he just a Jewish peasant, in fact, we know that he is the creator of all things, and he's the savior of the entire world, and therefore salvation is found only in him. That's why later Paul goes from Berea, in Acts 17, you can read it there. He goes down to the city of Athens. Now, talk about a metropolitan area. He goes into Athens. He preaches to the philosophers there. And they're like, who are you? What, 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 you're a babbler. What do you have to say? He preaches the gospel to them. And then in Acts 17, 30, he says, therefore, here's the summary, you Athenian philosophers. God has commanded everyone everywhere to repent and put their faith and trust in Jesus, who is going to return and judge the living and the dead. So Jesus gets exalted, certainly above all these, the, the altars and the idols that they have. But look at verse, chapter 2, verse 13, what Paul does here, is I just want to read it and just let it percolate on our lives. He, he leaves, he's gone for a few weeks, and he knows that there was trouble after he left. So he's like, Timothy, I'm going to go to Athens. You go back to Thessalonica. Find out how the church is doing. We, we love the church. They, they, they're brand new. They've only been saved a few weeks, maybe a couple months at the most. Will you go find out how they're doing and get back to me? Because I've been praying for them. I'm worried about them. And I want to see that the faith that they have is growing. So Paul's writing to them now later and reminding them. He says in chapter 2, verse 13, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. You think about that. This is important. As, as we say often, nobody gathers here on Sunday morning to hear Mondo's opinion. I hope not. Who cares? Amen. And what Paul is saying here is, hey guys, when we shared the truth with you, it wasn't the word of men. This wasn't just another theory, another option. Well, you know, Plato says this, and Aristotle says this, and this religious teacher says this. He says, you receive the word from us as it truly is the word of God. That's super important. So when we go out and we share the gospel around us, we come and we go, hey, look, I'm not here to give you my opinion. I'm here to tell you what the book says. This is what God says, and it's true for everyone, everywhere, every culture. So think about this. 
Is Christianity, the Bible, we'll say the Bible, is it a Western religion? You know, is it a Middle Eastern religion? We go and we go, no, this is the truth. God has commanded everyone, everywhere. Antarctica, the East, Asia, China, Africa. This is a gospel that goes out, and it's for all nations, for all people. They're, this is the hard part within our, within our uh, American culture. Is well, that's true for you. And you go, no. This is the truth for everyone. And what's sad is even in our culture, especially in our academic institutions, colleges, seminaries, whatever, we hear and we go, well, you know, um, you know, the, the, the Muslims are saved even though they don't know Jesus. Can you show me that in the Bible? Well, what about people of, of Hinduism or Buddhism? Well, they're saved without Jesus. Show me that in the Bible. This isn't politically correct. And what happens is, as we share the truth, again, not our opinion, it's going to cause conflict. It's going to cause trouble. Heck, Paul gets beat up over and over and over in the book of Acts. They grab Jason and his group and they bring him forth. And so the, the, what Paul is going to remind them is, hey, Thessalonians, welcome to Christianity. Welcome to being a Christian. Well, Paul, when he reminds them of this, I never told you. I never lied to you and said, if you follow Jesus, it's going to be roses and sunshine. If you follow Jesus and you declare the message, the word of God, not word of men, the word of God into the, the, the cultural environment, it's going to bring you trouble. It's going to bring you persecution. It's going to bring you affliction. In our modern words, what do we say? It's going to bring you censorship. They're, they're going to shame you. They're going to call you names. They're going to say you are woke. All these labels now, especially with social media, I mean, you can get people are people get shamed in social media every single day. Again, you, you got a million followers. I just I dare you. Jesus is the only way. All who don't follow him are not going to make it to heaven. How long will that last before you get attacked? And then what happens usually after that? I'm sorry I didn't mean it. Well, are you saying that you misrepresented God's word? Because that's where you should have started. You said, hey, man, I'm just a messenger. Don't shoot the messenger. It, and, and, and to me, I am a sissy. And here's what I mean. I have no problem blaming God. <laughs> hey! This is God's message. I didn't create it. It's not my opinion. I'm here to tell you what God said. If you have a problem with it, you take it up with him. God says, that's great. It's not about what you and I think. But he says here in verse 14, For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea, in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us and they do not please God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. And what he's saying is, hey Thessalonians, you're not the first ones to suffer persecution or affliction or being canceled, or being shamed. People who got saved in Jerusalem, same thing. This is where, Matthew 10, 34, Jesus says, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. I came, and that sword is truth. Truth does divide. And what are we supposed to do? Ephesians 4, 15, we speak the truth in love. We are kind. We don't go out there and beat people up and go, believe in Jesus, if you don't, I'm going to kill you or I'm going to beat you up. That's not what we're supposed to do. In fact, we go and we say, here's the gospel, and they might beat us up. Remember, when we talked about back in January, be careful what you pray for. In Acts chapter 4, they prayed for boldness. And in Acts chapter 5, they got beat up. But in 529, it says, they went out and they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. Now, I don't want that. 
and maybe you get beat up on social media. Stay strong, stay true. Don't back down. Well, you, I might lose, you might lose followers. Yeah, you probably will. Because the question for us is who are we trying to please? Are we trying to please God? And ultimately, all of us, we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and he's say, you know what, over here? You were looking for the approval of men rather than my approval. Why did you cave? Why did you compromise? Why didn't you stand bold? Why didn't you stand strong? This isn't your message anyway. Our job is to be faithful. He says in verse 17, but we, but we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time, in presence but not in heart, we have endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Paul says, man, we, after I got kicked out and there was all this trouble, I went over here, but I've been longing to get back to you. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, verse 18, even I, Paul, time and time again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or our joy or crown or rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and our joy. Therefore, we can no longer endure it. We thought it good to be left in Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and fellow laborer in the gospel to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. That no one should be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. I have that underlined in my Bible. We know, think about this. Matthew 7, 13, 14, Jesus talks about taking the narrow road, right? Go through the narrow gate. Enter by the, you know, go on the narrow road. Why? Because that way is difficult. And the question for us, what Paul's going to get to, it's going to go quick as we get in here, is are we living a life on the narrow path, and are we troublemakers? If you live your life to please everybody and have everybody like you, you're going to go and find trouble there. In fact, Jesus says in Luke 6, 26, Woe is it when everybody speaks well of you. Because what does that mean? If everybody speaks well of you, that means you're not causing any trouble. No, we're not out to cause trouble for the sake of it. But we know that if someone is living a life or living a life that's unrighteous or outside of God, we have to come along and we say, hey man or woman, you're not right with God based on the scripture. It's not based on my opinion. Well, that's offensive to me. Hey, I'm just a messenger. And ultimately, here's the question for us. Do we care about people? Do we believe, as scripture would say, that the world is lost? See, the culture says, no, the world's not lost. All roads lead to heaven. Well, if that's the case, then there's no, there's no reason to go out and evangelize it. Everybody's going to make it. Then we just go, ah, that's great. What's true for you is true for you. You'll be fine, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. And our truth is our truth, and their truth is their truth. That's not what Scripture teaches. But when you go into the marketplace of ideas, whether it's friends or family or coworkers, neighbors or social media, and we come in and we simply say, Jesus said, in John 14, 6, I am the way to heaven. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Man, that's, that is narrow. What are some labels? Narrow-minded, bigoted, arrogant. How dare you say your way? I'm not saying anything except what Jesus said. And we know later in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Peter says that there is salvation in no other name except Jesus. I can't believe Peter is so narrow-minded. And, and what happens is, is the world <laughs> is filled with false thinking. And Paul, again, what we would tell Paul, Paul recognized that these Thessalonians, these Greeks, they were lost in their religious system. Otherwise, he would have stayed home. Why go out and be a troublemaker? Why go out and get beat up? Why go out and get lashed? I mean, he got beat with rods. He got stoned. He was shipwrecked. He caused 
He caused a lot of trouble. Why would he do it? Well, we know the answer. In 2 Timothy 2.10, he says, I am doing all these things for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain salvation. You know why I do it? Because I know that God is saving people out there, and I want to go out and give them the gospel. And I know it's going to cause trouble. Jesus said, truth is going to bring division. And so what he says here, this is important for us. Verse 3. No one should be shaken by these afflictions. Hey guys, you've only been saved a few weeks. I know it's been in trouble, but don't be shaken by this. For you yourselves know that we were appointed for this. Now think about that. Who wants to be a Christian? Your life's going to get more troublesome. It's going to be with affliction. It's going to be with trouble. Who wants to sign up? This isn't the prosperity gospel. I can tell you this. <laughs> this is, hey man, life's going to get probably harder for you. That's why in 2 Timothy he says, all who desire to live godly, what? Will suffer persecution. A lot of times, have you ever seen this? I've seen it in my own life. I got saved at 18 from a whole bunch of unbelievably friends. And I didn't even preach to them. I just simply stopped partying with them. What'd they say? Oh, Bible thumper now. Holy roller. Oh, you think you're better than all of us? I didn't say anything to you. I just simply said, I don't want to do that anymore. If you desire to live godly, you will suffer persecution. Why? Because our language is different. We don't talk like them. We don't act like them. We don't make choices like that. But we're not saying we're better than them. We're actually saying, hey, man, I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm, I'm thankful that God forgave me. But what we know is that if you seek simply just to turn your life around, people are going to see something different. And then if you do open your mouth, well, then even more trouble comes. Okay? So let's go to First Timothy, or First Thessalonians chapter 1. And we're going to see some things here. Here's the question for us. If I ask you about the term or the word legacy, what does legacy mean? Something you leave behind, right? And that's the question, I think. Something that we leave behind, something that we're known for. For example, I'll give you a, a I'm not going to play favorites. We'll choose a Republican first. What is Nixon's legacy? Watergate. Watergate, okay? What's Clinton's legacy? Monica Lewinsky. See, we know them. We can let them go up. Okay? They each, have their, they each have their troubles. And the question that Paul is going to get to us is, and he, he, he's beginning to talk to the Thessalonians, and he says, hey, you guys are on a great start to leave an awesome legacy. And what are you, you know, it's kind of like the phrase, what do you want on your tombstone, okay? But the question for us, what, how are, are we living our life in the moment? And if we were to die today, what would we be remembered for? Would we be remembered for the kindness that we showed for the glory of God? Would we be remembered for our commitment to the gospel? Or would we be remembered for our worldly pursuits? <laughs> Because I'll tell you this, this isn't, again, it's not my opinion. If you're taking notes, write down Romans 14, 10 and 2 Corinthians 5, 10. Both these scriptures speak about us standing before Jesus, before the judgment seat of Christ. He's going to say, come up here. He's going to say, okay, I saved you here. What did you do with it? What sort of legacy... Did you leave for those that are remaining? And especially, I think about it as a, as a, as a parent, grandparent. What, how are we, what are our kids going to remember us, or our grandkids, or relatives, neighbors, whatever? Again, how are they going to remember us? What is going to be our reputation, our legacy for those that are left? And to me, another verse is, Gosh, it's Matthew 12, 36. This is scary. Jesus says, we will give an account for every idle word that we speak. <laughs> Think about that. Every random word is, you know, people say the devil's in the details. I don't agree with that. God is in the details. Jesus said, he 
that, when we stand there, we will give, give an account for every just random word we speak. How much more what characterizes our life? And that's why, again, this series is living a life of focus and expectation of Jesus' return. And as we know, I mean, we know that we're waiting for Jesus' return. And it's 2020 was a great year if you study prophecy. Man, a lot happened in 2020. That's just like, well, wow, straight out of the Bible. So we know that we are approaching the end of the age. We are here. It's, it's factual. This isn't, this isn't wishful thinking. I'm not saying Jesus is coming next week. But nevertheless, as, 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 this, is a, this isn't a threat. It's just a reminder. We can go out here and be dead tomorrow, right? We can die in a car accident. Who knows? And either through death or through Jesus' return, we're going to stand before him, and he's going to say, let's see what you did. In order for that to go well, we need to make decisions today so that, you know, God is very gracious. Hey, Lord, I haven't really been living the way I should or talking the way I should or uh, keeping you seeking first the kingdom the way I should. Lord, I apologize for that. I want to make this dedication today so that from here on out, God says, let's do it. Isn't God gracious like that? He's awesome. He says, yeah, let's move forward. Let's move forward in your commitments to me, in, in your holiness, in your righteousness, in your commitment to evangelism, and to sharing about others. And we're going to see two things today. A life worth following will include having a spiritual base or foundation, and it will include having a spiritual legacy. Let's just, I'll just read this, and then we'll come to the here. He says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church, of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, he's been gone for a few weeks, and, and he, he said Timothy, and Timothy has returned out of Athens and said, Hey, Paul, man, the Thessalonians are doing great. Yeah, they're getting persecuted. Yeah, they're in trouble. But, man, they have not walked away, even with all the trouble that they got. So Paul now is writing to them to encourage them. He says, Grace to you and peace. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. Here again, he brings up the fact that this isn't some random thing. That they were chosen by God. He says, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. He says, and you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believed. For from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we have to you, and how you turn to God from idols, to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So right here on Lesson 1, this, well, the title is, Are You and I, Are We Living a Life That Is Worth Following? And he says to them, Hey guys, it's amazing what God has done in you. In fact, your example has gone out in all of the surrounding areas because they're watching you, and you didn't come to faith in Jesus Get persecuted and walk away. You stood strong, and we saw in chapter 2, you received this word, as it truly is, not human opinion, but the word of God, and now, you know what you've done? It's awesome. You've turned away from all those idols. You don't go to the temple anymore to make your sacrifice to Zeus, or sacrifice to Artemis, or whatever. You have turned from all that, what? Paganism. To serve the true and living God. And that really is a characterization of a, of a person who has come to faith in Jesus. It means that they have walked away 
from their old life and all of its false thinking and false behavior, false morals, all those other things that we would call the old life. But he says here, a, a spiritual foundation will involve a vocation of faith. And what I mean by that, he says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and patience. So I put a couple things on there that you can look. Is the idea of a work of faith is, here's the question for us. Is your faith in Jesus, your Christian experience, is it something that you do one day a week? I remember when I first became Christian, I, of course, I had a big mouth. Okay, So I would share the gospel with all my friends. And I had one, one of my buddies, so I grew up with him. I mean, he's known him for my whole life. He said, you're a little extreme. And I go, oh, really? And he goes, I give God one hour a week on Sundays. That's what he wants from us. And I go, oh. And I said, well. And I started sharing these verses. You know? I said, well, is that your opinion, or do you have a verse on that? <laughs> because according to 2 Corinthians 5.15, we live for Christ. I've given you some verses there as well. That whether we live or whether we die, we do all things for the glory of God. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. That's why Philippians 1.21, Paul says, for me to live is Christ. Now, does that mean everybody needs to be, well, let me ask you a true question. I'm going to interrupt myself. I'm do that often. How many of you are in full-time ministry? Trick question, right? I didn't ask if you got paid. Are you a full time Christian? Is there any other type of Christian experience? I'm a part time Christian. I get my one hour a week on Sundays. Jesus says, if anybody, now think about this, Luke 9 62, it's a good verse. If anybody puts their hand to the plow and looks back, they're not worthy of the kingdom. Do, does, does Jesus ever say to us, hey, you know what? When you come to me, I'm okay if you follow one of the Ten Commandments. As long as you just give me something. What's the first commandment? Love God with what? Oh. oh. It's interesting that when the message goes out, Jesus does not compromise and say, well, just give me 10%. He makes it difficult. When you come, if you put your hands to the plow like, here we go, and you look back, oh, look at my old life, don't sign up. That's why in Luke 14, when Jesus is talking about discipleship, he says, make sure, he gives different parables, make sure you count the cost before you sign up. Now, granted, if you don't sign up, that's a decision, and you're just going to be trouble from that. But don't, don't you dare... Think that when you come here, I'm going to accept 50%. Now, he's not talking about perfection. What Jesus wants is our commitment. He wants our loyalty. He wants our adoration. And he knows that we're going to stumble. He never said, hey, when you sign up, you're going to have a perfect life. Otherwise, what's the point of if we confess our sins, it's faithful and just to cleanse us? We screw up. But he says, when you sign up, I want all of it. The first commandment is to love me with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And that's when we think about all of us are full-time Christians to some degree. Now, granted, God might call you to be an engineer. He might call you to this. Who knows? A teacher, you name it, whatever. And in the midst of that, serve him. Whatever it is. But as Christians, we don't walk in and we don't say, well, I'm going to hang up my Christian coat or put the keys on the thing. I'll get back to you and I go live this way. And he says here, hey guys, we have heard about your work of faith. And the second thing, a spiritual foundation will involve a vocation of faith. It will involve a labor of love. And here's the question. Is serving the Lord easy at times? Now, Next week, a week from today, some of us will be embarking on one of the toughest weeks of the year. <laughs> Vacation Bible School. And, but I'll tell you this. God loves what kind of giver? 
Cheerful. Cheerful. Don't lie. <coughs> oh, I gotta do BBS. Oh, God says, hey, this is a labor of love. And in Hebrews 6.10, I think, I don't know if I have that on there. Yeah, I do. Hebrews 6.10 says, God is not unjust. Justice now. God is not unjust to forget your labor that you do for his name. That is going to build your spiritual bank account. And it's okay to do it to build your spiritual bank account. Jesus said that in Matthew 6. Store up treasures where? In heaven. But God loves a cheerful giver. Don't come in. Oh, I'm so tired. Oh, man. Hey, it's only been one day of DBS so far. <laughs> okay? Don't come in all, you know, you know, like the Pharisees, right? They come in all saggy. They're looking to show themselves to be tired. And Jesus says, you have your reward. And if you're looking for people to feel sorry for you, you got your reward. But why do we serve God? We do it because, well, he's worthy. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. And when we come, God loves a cheerful giver. And that could be financially or any other thing that we do. And Paul's looking at them, and he says, hey, I see the labor of love that you guys are doing for the kingdom. That's part of our legacy. That's part of what we should be known for. Is man, man, that guy loves to serve Jesus. That woman loves to serve. And when, when an opportunity arises, then they're on it. Spiritual foundation will involve the patience of hope. He says there, and you have patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And patience here is this long suffering. For example, again, these guys, they get saved, and the next day they're getting persecuted. Well, in fact, the same day, right? Because they grab Jason, who gets to receive the gospel. He gets drawn before the county officials. And now he has to post bond. And he goes off and he says, you know what? I'm okay with this. Why? Because all of us, hopefully, we understand that it's worth it. In Matthew 5, 16, Jesus makes a comment that if you get persecuted for his name, great is your reward in heaven. So, I remember when I was, again, my sisters and my family, and you know, they're still on their way, okay? But they used to persecute, persecute, and I, I was just reading that Matthew 5 passage and say, can you get more because my reward's going up every time you do this? This is awesome. <laughs> because is Jesus speaking figuratively, or does he really mean it? Are there any random things? Remember, every idle word, we're going to give an account. So when Jesus says, if you're persecuted for my name, great is your reward in heaven. Now, if you're persecuted for being a jerk, eh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> being over the top. But if you're persecuted and speaking the truth of love, and people just hate the message, yeah, they understood that, yes, it's long-suffering, but we have hope. The spiritual foundation will involve the joy of the Holy Spirit. And, and remember, we know from Philippians 4.4, 4, when, when Paul's in prison, he's chained to a guard, and he's writing to the Philippians, and what does he say? Rejoice always, and again I say rejoice. And we go, wow, Paul, that's very spiritually minded. Or we know in James 1 verse 2, count all joy, brethren, when you fall into various what? Trials, Trials or afflictions. That's, that's spiritual. I mean, that, that's... We, we, I want to believe that I'm on the way to think that way. That's hard to do. Rejoice when you're persecuted or rejoice when trials come. But we know, I, I have here a quote, there are no hopeless situations. There are only people who have grown hopeless about them. And of all people as Christians, can a Christian, uh, let me rephrase it, should a Christian ever be a person of hopelessness or despair? No way! Unless you deny the faith. Because by definition, we have eternal hope because we have an eternal God who is provident, who, who, whose providence guides us and guards us. He's sovereign over all things. And we go, man, even in this situation, Job said in Job 13, 15, even if he kills me, I'm still going to trust him. That's, that's amazing faith, especially for an Old Testament saint. God wants us to examine and, and begin to build our foundation. Again, when people look at us, 
Do they see people who are filled with faith, love, and hope, and joy in the Holy Spirit? Are we walking around Eeyore mentality? Oh, woe is me. When somebody says, how are you doing? You know what? In God's sovereignty and in his love and in his kindness to me, I am right where God has me today. Really? Yep. God's working all things for my good. I'm not saying that your dog dies and you walk out and you're joking. Okay, I'm not talking about it. There's a reality here of grief, but we go, you know, I trust God. I don't understand it all, but I have hope, I have confidence that God is working. I know that he's going to make good out of it, and I have hope and confidence. And it's Romans 8, 28. It doesn't say, and we guess. It says, and we know that God causes all things to work together to those who love him, to those who are called, according to what? His purpose. His purpose. Sometimes, let's be honest, God's purpose is different than ours. We know that. But we submit and we say, okay, Lord. That's why 1 Peter 5, he says, submit yourself under the mighty hand of God, and in due time, he will exalt you. The mighty hand there is a sovereign hand. You go, okay, Lord, uh, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to submit to you. The life of Paul, will include having a spiritual legacy. A spiritual legacy will involve a life that is evangelistic. And again, the question for us is this. When God, when we stand before Jesus that day, is God going to ask you this question? How many people did you save? No. He's going to say, how many people did you tell about me? The saving's his job. Well, Lord, I told ten, and you saved one. God says, hey, you're responsible for the ten. If I only save one, that's my business. Our job is to go out there and open our mouth and leave the fruit and the results up to him. That's why in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Our job is simply to open our mouth, and he says, hey, I, I made you, I, I feel real about this, and all of us should in some ways, I made you the neighbor of this guy, and you never shared the gospel with him. How long were you neighbor there? Ten years. And you never shared, you never told him about it? Yeah, I'm sorry, Lord. I know I should have. I should have reached out to him. He said, I made you their neighbor so that you could share the gospel. I chose you to be there and instead of somebody else. Is anything random? Again, nothing's random. I put you in this class. I put you here. I put you in this family. Again, I was adopted. So that's kind of a, it doesn't really matter if, whether it's secondary or primary. If you were born there, God could have had you born in India. And we, we often say, we can choose our friends but not our family, right? <laughs> God says, I chose them for you. Thank you, Lord. Okay. But he says, I chose you to be there. And I think about me. It's just my, I was adopted there. I grew up in this family as a baby. I grew up. And so far, I'm the only one that's, by God's grace, following. But what's the goal? Share. And now you, all of us can come and go, hey, I've shared it with my family. Is it my job to save them? No. Lord, I'm innocent. I shared the truth with them. I hope that they come around, all of them, and follow you truly. But I'm not responsible because it's not. You shared the truth with them. Will people look at you? Is that one of your, will that be a part of your legacy? Man, I, it's, think about this. The person dies and they go, all I know is, God, they kept telling me about Jesus all the time. That's a great legacy. That's something that we want to be known for. A spiritual legacy will involve a life that is sanctified. He talks to them about the way that they, your faith toward God has gone out. We don't need to say anything. You turn from idols to serve the living God. You know, you know what their legacy is? A changed life. Think about this way. 
Think about someone that has known you your whole life. And then they know you after you have come to be a Christian. Will that person say, all I know is, well, I knew them when they were not a Christian, and their life as a Christian is different. Will they say that about you? Again, not that we're out preaching necessarily judgment on everybody and we're holier than thou, because oftentimes as Christians we do that and that's unfortunate. We should come in humility and say, hey man, what's good, the gospel for me changed my life, it can change yours too. I'm not any better than you, I'm just saved by grace. We need to be careful how we phrase it. Oftentimes, this is us. You need to be saved. Looking down, instead of coming along and aside and saying, you need to be saved, man. I'm no different than you. In fact, we partied together, or we did this together. And God can save you and change your, just, your life just like he did mine. But oftentimes, when we look at our pre-Christian life versus our pro, pro, post-Christian life, or in the sense of after we come to Jesus, there's no change. They're going to go, this is kind of the worst thing. I didn't know they were Christian. How long have you known them? 40 years? They died? There we are at the funeral, and they come in, and here we are talking about them. We're eulogizing them. Hey, this person is a Christian. They, they, they follow Christ. They were at church. I didn't know they were a Christian. Oh, what a horrible legacy that would be. And you see this, this, this parable of, is there enough evidence against you that you would be convicted if you were put on trial and being a Christian? And what Paul's saying to them is, Hey guys, you, we have proof now that you actually turned from idols to serve the living God. Jesus has changed your life and proof is in the pudding. A spiritual legacy will involve a life that is anticipating. I love this passage. He says to them in verse 10, You are waiting for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. These Thessalonians, and we'll get, we haven't got, this is just the first chapter. But their life changed in such a way, they said, well, what are you waiting for? Now, we're waiting for Jesus. We know that he's coming back, and when he comes back, I want to be ready. We're waiting, because he's going to deliver us, the good pre-trib verse. What is he delivering us from? From that end time wrath, that judgment, the tribulation, whatever, however you want to phrase it, it's certainly eternal wrath. But I don't think that's the context. I think the context we'll see in all of Thessalonians is the end times, which they believed they were part of. But they're waiting and going, man, I know I have trouble. I know I'm being persecuted. I know I have affliction. But man, I'm waiting because when Jesus comes back, I want to be ready. And for us, the question is, are we ready? Can you stand with prayer? Well, as we come this morning, Again, it's, it's such an exciting time and it's an exciting book to study because these truths are just as relevant for us as it was for them. I pray that each one, one of us, Lord, in humility, would come to that point of asking ourselves, are we leaving a legacy that's worth following? Help us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, that we would commit ourselves in a fresh way to be evangelistic, to be a person of hope, to be a person of faith, to be a person that is working and that we love our service to you. Lord, that people would look at us and say, man, all we know is they love Jesus and they act like it. They're not perfect, but they live and their words are seasoned with grace and there, there's something about them that is different. We know, Lord, as well, that when we come on that day, we're going to give an answer for everything. And that is something that's important. It's not meant to condemn, but I hope, Lord, that all of us walk in here and say, how can I make that firm and fresh commitment to follow you with all of my heart, not something? We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Mondo just gave us our marching orders, and we're going to leave with a little bit of a marching song. <laughs> One, two, three, four.
God. Praise God. Let's give God a hand. All right. Well, it was wonderful to have you guys praise the Lord with us today. And uh, we will see y'all next Sunday and uh, bring some work shoes so we can set up BBS. See you then. BBS.